Now, um, but let's get everybody involved. We have our astrologers here, and uh, we have questions and answers and thoughts, you know. So what, uh, now let's look, is there a question? Oh, yes. It's really good to be reminded to be reminded. Because tomorrow evening at 6.30, we have the uh, open house uh, by the ceremonial group right over here in the Palo Verde room. And uh, they, um, well, the, the contribution that this group makes is really subjectively important because uh, they are ceremonialists and ritualists and the workers with the David Kingdom, and they are sustaining the inner integrity of the conference all the way through. So they do a tremendous job, and they, and they are going through all sorts of subjective processes, working with what we might call the manifestation of the inner name. So they're going to create their altars uh, for tomorrow, and it will be a one-hour, approximately, event from 6.30 to 7.30. And you are welcome, invited, to come over. Y'all come now. Y'all come now. It, it's always a delicious thing to do, and so eat fast, and then come over there at 6.30 to 7.30. Right. Uh, you know, we, we have that whole uh, David stream running simultaneously with this rather intellectual stream that we're doing when we study astrology. And uh, I find it uh, etherically, angelically necessary. Uh, ever since it's been happening, the whole conference has been taking on a whole other it, it, it uh, really began happening seriously in 2004, which was our four, fourth Ray conference, our earlier one, 2002, rather. And at the same time, we began to have that new group of world servers theme, which Sheldon and Helena have been so instrumental in bringing in another fourth Ray theme, because the new group of world servers uh, is ruled by the fourth Ray. So it was at that time and continuing forward that the fourth ray came in so powerfully along with the seventh ray on the day of the line. So we want to support that, just the way we want to go dancing tonight. We want to support that, too. You know? And I, I mean, you know, when I look at some of us sitting around hour after hour, we could use a good dance, right? Okay. Now, are there any... Uh, what did you learn over the last two days? What stuck in your mind? What was the? Uh, what were the factors? Just, just briefly, briefly, you know, just brief and to the point. What did what stuck with you? What what made its impression? Starting from now backwards. Nothing, right? Okay. The great void. Did, did we have to? You can't escape Ray Four. Not being a human being, you cannot escape Ray Four. I will also repeat the question uh, or the answer if it's short enough. But Sharon, being Gemini and Mercury here, and also having plenty of third ray, will get around. Okay. Is there anything else that uh, stuck with you, impressed you? This is a test. <laughs> Scorpio, yes, it's a great sign, isn't it? I'm sure we all have either had it or will have it. Yes, Peter. The introductory meditation was incredible for me. It was really great. The first day, okay. the morning. Good, good. Yeah, thank you. The introductory meditation. Yes, well, you know, the new schools, if I may say a word, are schools of meditation. And the major thing that's going on in those schools will eventually be the five hours of daily meditation, even in the probationary school, preparatory school. So even though we are astrologers, we can learn to meditate. There are many things astrologers can't do. It's like herding cats. Or perhaps uh, singing is another thing that astrologers tend not to do. But we certainly can meditate. That we can do. Okay, what else? Anything else? Okay, the destiny of humanity and the Jewish race. Um, yeah. And our healing meditations really direct a lot of healing energy towards the Jewish Very good. Exactly. Sheldon, would you please say what you told me today? about Zionism and all of that, yeah? This was just an insight based upon what, uh, what Philip was saying and also uh, Michael mentioned that um, we're all Jewish, you know, and this is kind of, and so therefore as we, as we work with, with that part of ourselves, um, 
uh, moving solar plexus to heart. We are helping to heal the planet. But particularly the, what, what struck me was the, the Zionist aspect in all of us. This is that aspect which is regressive, wants to return to the past, grabs land, goes back, touts, as Milosevic did, you know, some, some battle that was lost 500 years ago in our country here. It's the Tea Party who wants to get back to no government. You know, it's, it's all of these regressive tendencies. It's the Zionist in all of us. As we confront that, we help the healing process, and we take the burden off scapegoating uh, the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. That triggered in me is how it's linked to the moon in our chart. So as we... You have a microphone. The moon, the moon uh, we know Ray Fall comes through that, and as we work on our own lunar uh, pattern, we are actually helping to heal the Jewish race, which is really Ray Fall, and also uh, rules the solar plexus chakra in the planet like that and so as we do that work uh, personal work we're actually inadvertently doing that work as well that's so important i think the greatest contribution as we all know is to do our own work look after our own stuff clean up our own mess and inadvertently it's helping all of humanity well we know that but particularly the jewish race which the the whole key of the problem is tied up with how yeah. we relate there well i think we all have a libran decision at the moment whether we will go forward or go backward. And every, um, if we use Zionism as a metaphor, it's always going back to a former glory. In that respect, the Nazis were Zionists. They wanted to reconstruct the Aryan Superman of 250,000 years ago. Totally psychic, totally capable, you know, a masterful individual that was uh, lost to racial intermixture. You know, the uh, Mussolini was a Zionist in that respect. He wanted to go back to the glory of Rome. The Japan wanted the rising sun. Now we have the Islamists and they want the caliphate. Every time you go backwards, you are a metaphorical Zionist in that respect, pining nostalgically for what was, instead of re realizing the true glory of what is to be, namely Shambhala beckoning to us, the true promised land. So I think you're very right. If we have managed to spread that concept around, realizing the retrogression that exists in every human being when they follow the lunar aspect of their nature, we will, what I can call, distribute blame, and it will land squarely on the shoulders of each of us who follow those retrogressive tendencies. Okay, we have another comment over here. Just tied in with what Peter mentioned about memory. Yeah, that was Standing in the way of the intuition. I'm not sure of the word. But of the quote, can yeah. you share the exact quote of what? Memory obstructing intuition? Well, I was thinking of Krishnamurti, this book uh, called The Network of Thought. It's a wonderful reference. He goes to it in detail, but it's uh, basically thinking with memory, uh, basically prefab units drawn from memory, from uh, what's impulsively uh, just a uh, popping up at the moment, uh, everything we take for granted, all these sorts of things create a network, a cobweb of yeah. thought, and it's, if we use the memory correctly uh, in a constructive way, then we're, f uh, we're free to think uh, clearly, and, and that brings an intuition. Yeah, so, Jesse. Um, yeah, I, I explored this in my book, Initiation to Krishnamurti, because Krishnamurti said that he, he wiped his memory about twice, I think, during that life, where he had no recall of anything that happened before. And he was a Taurus with uh, Saturn and Scorpio and something else in Scorpio. So that You're Taurus Scorpio axis was, was very active in the, in the sense that a, a Taurus is acquisitive and acquires lots of knowledge, spiritual or otherwise. But at some point, it has to relinquish release all that in the Scorpio polarity and, and die to that and, and, and invoke the intuition uh, as a result. So it's a very beautiful kind of um, interaction that takes place between those, those two, two sides. And DK says that the, the memory constitutes the dweller of Scorpio. What's that effect? Yes, yes, yes. You learn the true... true uh, you actually summon to the surface via uh, Pluto and the Moon in Scorpio all that is residual in the lower part of the aura, and the question is, can you handle it? I mean, you've got to bring it up, but you've got to dissipate it as well. Sometimes I think that uh, for humanity, the moon must fall in Scorpio. 
And I think that in the fall of the moon will be the end of the retrogression. Because, you know, there's a lot in us that longs for the third solar system, the earlier one. Well, third ray, first solar system, or what can we call it, the first uh, major solar system. As there were probably solar systems before that of a minor kind. So that was the major personality solar system we all came out of. And there's a lot of that when we're threatened on the threshold of expanding and becoming something new that nostalgically longs for something safer and more familiar. So, so you know, when the moon falls in Scorpio finally, and Mercury is uh, hierarchically in a way exalted, then we will have achieved what we're supposed to as a human race. Yes, other uh, questions or comments? Yes. Anybody? Yes, yes. No, 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 I didn't have a question. Well, that was the stretch, yes. Yeah. The stretch is always good, you know. Yes, okay. I'm trying to see me, too. <laughs> yes, Gail, over here. Yes. Well, we learned about the cycles of Jupiter. I'm not sure I understood all the intricacies, but um, certainly some insight into the need for further study. The mathematics of it is amazing. amazing. Yeah, just you know, it's almost like God has amazing. a plan or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the solar logo seems to have calculated all this out, you know, and we sort of respond to the math. It's just amazing. Peter always brings that in, you know, and I say, well, one day I'm going to sit down and really study these cycles and see how they all, you know, fit together. It would take a while, huh? Yeah, eminently worth it when astronomy and astrology really unite as they will quite soon, I think. What else, everybody? Anybody? Yes. In the meditation this morning, the introductory, uh, it was interesting in our little group how closely knit our symbols were. And they were all geometric and definitely related. Mm. And it, it, it became quite clear that, in a sense, because they came right out of the astrology, we were uh, looking at the conflicting you know, astrological aspects. And each of them coalesced as a particular form of geometry. And it really makes me realize that that's always going on, mm. it, whether we realize it or not. In, in everything that's said uh, astrologically, there's a form. You know, for instance, yeah. in, in, in Elena's uh, discussion of the 12 disciples, uh, if, if you take 12 ex uh, spheres and put them together, they exactly touch the 13th in the center. It's the only form that does that. So it's, it's a natural geometry for 12 disciples with a master. It's, Perfect. In, Perfect. it's causal. Yeah, it is. yeah you know, uh, uh, this is Francis who's speaking. He's a wonderful esoteric artist, you know, and he's been producing uh, for the Moria uh, Federation some... Uh, wonderful images uh, upon which we can meditate and he has a lot of great ideas about uh, divine geometry and how it can be used in the meditative uh, process. So please do speak with him about these things because he's evolving some really interesting approaches. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other learnings? Any other things you'd like to question or ask besides why did I come here? You know, okay. Anything? <laughs> I don't, you know, you, as you see we have a great diversity of astrological approaches, don't we? I mean, you know, we're assembling, you know, I think some of the best esoteric astrologers uh, in the world, frankly. Uh, I, there, are, there are a few more of you out there, I know. So, uh, but um, but you certainly, you know, it, it's, it's not like a beginning class, particularly. That's why we're so grateful for Jan to help certain people get the foundation so they can get up to, to speed on all this. Because this is sometimes a bit like a graduate class when you come in here. And for those of us who have been coming here year after year, uh, you know, we made some incremental progress in the understanding of, of different people's approaches. And, and it's all moving towards synthesis from an astrological perspective. I mean, that's one of the great ways of becoming synthetic in your thinking, is to study the new esoteric astrology. It really helps to broaden and interrelate everything it's in the content of consciousness of our solar systemic God. So uh, keep coming back, as it were. You know. uh, anything else? Anything else you'd like to say, question, or ask? Just a comment about, um, I came in, um, Lee and I both came in with a sense of the power of the fourth ray. And um, 
We'll hear more about that at some later point. But what comes home from these uh, the, these two days here is uh, how absolutely essential it is that we keep touching the buddhic plane through these various planets invoking these energies and as we do we do bring down some aspect of the new and we can we can make that happen now and you now those words new and now are so forth ray you know because in a way everything that is cyclic and repetitive is going on in the dense physical body of the solar logos and planetary logos and when you touch the buddhic plane you're touching the eternal now, you're touching that which is new because it involves the descent of ideas which are to come. You are touching that which begins to live at the fourth level. So otherwise we're just stuck in rotary motion. Even when we're, we're, even when we're in the causal body, it's still rotary motion. And the real spiral cyclic motion begins on the buddhic plane. So we're, we're, we're touching the, um, what you would call it, the uh, next frontier for thinking people. You know, uh, the thinker has to become intuitive, and that's what we're trying to do at this point. So it's a very important venture. Just to comment there on the fourth ray, uh, Michael. Yes. Um, the cycle is supposed to start in 2025. Um, what's the actual cycle going to be for 2,500 years? Or, or, or uh, Well, Stephen uh, Pugh believes that the the, the number 25, 250, 2,500 is a fourth rate cycle. And I think he has a good basis for yeah. that. And so w w my point was it's going to be a fairly long cycle. Yeah. And, and you know, you can take the analogy with Mercury retrograde. When it goes direct, it takes about two weeks to get back up to its normal speed. And also with the overlapping cusps of 2,000-year of cycles, it's about a 500-year cusp. So mm -hmm. really, we are... We have started this fourth race cycle already. We're in it now. It's not going to change right on no. some date in 2025, which is we've been told it's going to start. Well, even in 1924, he says there's a cosmic fire reference that a fourth race cycle began in 1924, presumably at the end right. of 1924 right. when 1925 was beginning. Yeah. So and there are sub race cycles and there's a major cycle. So, so we're really in it now, but that's my main point. Yeah. And there's another, you know, if you really want to, the fourth ray is with us, believe me, because... <coughs> We're, we're in the middle, or we, there's a fourth race cycle which has been operative for several thousand years already and has a mere 40,000 years to run. We're still in that fourth race cycle, which must be planetary in a way. It must have something to do with the relation of Mercury to our planet. It's uh, way beyond a, a strictly human or racial cycle. So, you know, the science of cycles, let's just say... Uh, and maybe we'll get into that somewhat next year, you know, when we, we're dealing with, uh, I hope we'll be dealing with something like the conquest of illusion. So you'll all leave illusion free. I hope something, uh, something like that. But when you master the science of cycles, uh, you have what D.K. calls uh, all knowledge with respect to what a human being can have anyway. In other words, you're dealing with the third level of the third plane. You know, the atomic plane, third level, and the third subplane of the atomic plane. So it's a, it's a great third ray thing when we can uh, acquire this science of cycles. And that, in a way, we, we are newbies attempting to do this. There's a great astrological department on the inner side of nature, and uh, we're just getting a few crumbs from the tables of the gods, you know. But uh, we're on our way, and one day we will know when things are to happen and when they're supposed to happen and how we can cooperate with that. Okay. Okay. Are we pretty well uh, questioned out and statement out? That's good. Well, then what we'll have then is the great in... Yes, uh, yes. Nicholas. Nicholas. The, Nicholas is uh, Mike. Just a brief comment on what Philip was saying. Um, having studied some of the race cycles and their connection to astrology, I would just mention that in 2024-2025, in the planet Neptune will make its ingress into the first sign of the zodiac, Aries, the ram, and that will give a great impulse to the fourth ray, which the planet Neptune carries a lot on, being the synthesizing planet uh, along the second ray line. So that coincides with that year of 2025. Mm. 
So there you have the ray cycles and the astrology very much tied together as an example. It's a very good example. And, you know, whenever I think of that beautiful uh, entry of Neptune uh, into Aries, at that time, I also think about the reappearance of the Christ. Because, you know, Neptune is Vishnu, the Christ, and Aries is about, here I come, you know. So uh, this is the beginning of, uh, in other words, and, and, you know, and that's backed up by the idea that the era of the forerunner ends in 2025. So if the forerunner ends in 2025, what does it forerun? It foreruns the externalization and also the eventual reappearance of the great Lord after the masters have established themselves in the planetary centers. Kathy? Yeah, in, in alignment with that, it's also, you know, Blavatsky says that the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Pisces was like the signature of the coming of Christ, and there's a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius in 2020. Okay. So that could be also That's another also signature. harbinger of things to come. So we live in very exciting times. You know, we cannot despair. We cannot become inert. We cannot become fragmented and, and dispersed. We have to, like I said earlier there, uh, concentrate uh, our powers now as we never have before. Because I'd like to say that the last 14 years of the era of the forerunner, as 14 is most significant in that great bear, little bear kind of thing, had better be our best effort. You know, right now, as it is so far, uh, as an esoteric group in the world, uh, we've been given a lot of teaching. And we, as DK would say, well, you think you're working at your full point of tension, but you're not. And we are not. And we should take it seriously that we could do more and better. Uh, everyone should take that personally, seriously. And then the whole group progress would be uh, uh, manifoldly more powerful. And I'd really like to see that. I'd like to see everybody here in 2025, uh, in the body or out of the body, whatever, uh, you know, present, uh, pushing forward toward that momentous uh, time of, um, it's, it's, it's just when everything really kicks off in the real sense. Uh, because he says that in 2025, most probably, how does he put it, uh, the, the first stages of the plans for the externalization, the practical externalization, will occur. And that will be followed by the great wave of expectancy, which will bring with it the, the reappearance of the actual Christ. So the masters and the disciples have some grounding work to do in the great centers, and then the Christ will arrive on the great wave of expectation. When that will be, well, he says the Piscean influence will certainly disappear in, the, um, in, in this century, 21st century. So we have a lot of work cut out for us. Well, let's, um, you know, let's do the great invocation together. begin with an omen, end with three. From the point of light, Within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love, within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve.
from the center, which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Hey everyone, thank you and 